Good morning. Welcome to our study this morning. We're continuing our look at uh, creation and evolution and the uh, two predominant theories of creation called the young earth theory and the gap theory. And we started off with them. Then we went uh, through several, several episodes of uh, evolution and uh, creation debates. And uh, now we're back to our summarization and conclusions regarding the gap theory and the young earth theory. So this week we'll look at uh, some objections to the gap theory and get started on looking at what I consider to be probably the best of the gap theory books that are uh, out there. And we'll look at that uh, probably this week and next to see exactly what he says and we'll uh, compare these anti-gap theory uh, articles with what we see to see if there's any real validity in their objections or any real validity in the gap theory itself. Uh, there are problems with both and uh, at the very end I'll uh, attempt to uh, consolidate and to resolve those difficulties. So let's begin with a moment of prayer, the opportunity to utilize silent prayer to confess any known sins to the Father uh, in conformance with the command uh, or with a promise. Uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So please pray with me. Father, as we look at these things today, though we know this is not a critical doctrine uh, in the uh, realm of things, uh, we do know that all Scripture is God-breathed and, uh, and forms a function in our lives. So we, uh, we do wish to know the truth regarding this matter. So we ask that you show us as we study so that we might understand it and uh, have a good concept of it uh, for uh, use in witnessing and uh, for use in explaining, uh, but uh, not in arguing. We thank you for all of it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look first at the, uh, at the preeminent anti-gappers, uh, Henry Morris and Ken Ham and uh, uh, Gadsby. Uh, and I I've taken these from their website, uh, Answers in Genesis or Creation Research. I they have so many I can't keep track of which one is which. But, but these are some sh relatively, three relatively short articles. We'll probably only do two of them because the third pretty much uh, summarizes uh, the first two. So uh, let's start with uh, The Gap Theory, An Idea with Holes by Henry M. Morris. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without, was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Many people assume there is a great gap in time between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Most of these do this to accommodate the geological age system of billions of years of supposed earth history in the Genesis record of creation. The idea is something like this. Billions of years ago, God created the space-mass-time universe. Then the geological ages took place over billions of years of Earth history. The different forms of life developed that are now preserved in the fossil record. These life forms represent those ages, the invertebrates of the Cambrian period, the dinosaurs of the Cretaceous period, finally the mammals, birds, and ape men of the Tertiary period, just before the recent epoch. Then the idea is that at the end of these geological ages, a great cataclysm took place on earth with, with Satan having rebelled in heaven and many of the angels following him in that rebellion. God therefore cast him to the earth and the earth underwent a great cataclysm, leaving it finally without form and void and with darkness on the face of the deep as described in Genesis 1-2. Subsequently, according to this idea, usually known as the gap theory, 
God then recreated or reconstituted the earth in the six literal days of creation recorded in the first chapter of Genesis. Well, how many of you agree with his, uh, uh, his portrayal of the, of the gap theory so far? No, not a lot, right? Not a lot. Uh, and, and you'll see this, and I point this out at this time so that you'll be aware of it and look for it throughout uh, these articles. Uh, there is a lot of straw man arguments in the anti-gappers. They say that this is what the gap theory believes, and they pick, uh, I guess maybe we couldn't call it uh, a perfect straw man, because there are gappers who believe certain parts of these things. And uh, so they take the worst of what gap theorists believe and argue against them and apply it to all gap theorists. Okay, So watch for that. The argument for this theory makes verse 2 read, the earth became without form and void. Some would render it the earth became waste and desolate, as though it had previously been a beautiful world, but now, because of the cataclysm, it was a devastated remnant of a world so that there was a change of condition. It became without form and void. This chapter is called Was Means Was. A significant problem with this idea is that the Hebrew word for was really should be translated was. It should not be translated became. It is the Hebrew verb of being, hayah, and normally it is simply translated was. In all the standard translations of the Old Testament, that is the way this verse is rendered. On some occasions, in an unusual situation, if the context requires it, the word can be translated became. There are some instances like that in the Old Testament. A, a whole bunch, actually. <laughs> By far, the tremendous majority of times, however, when the verb is used, it is simply translated was. Obviously, that's when you, when you do the, the verb to be. Uh, most of the time, it's going to be is or was, and uh, only in times of perfect tense or pluperfects or uh, other tenses other constructs will it be translated something other than is or was. In the absence of any indication in the immediate context that it should be rendered by a change of state where it became something which it wasn't, one would normally assume it was simply a declarative statement describing how the situation existed at the time. What's problem? What's problem with this argument? How much context do you have? It's the second verse of the Bible. <laughs> There's no real context to it, is there, other than verse 1, all right? So that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a little bit of a false argument. And, well, I'll just let uh, our other author, our gap author, uh, cover all of these things. I won't bring them up uh, other than just little brief uh, interjections here. The earth was, in response to God's creative fiat, initially without form and void. Some people use Isaiah 45, 18 as an argument for the use of became in Genesis 1, 2. In this verse, Isaiah says that God created the earth not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. The word in vain is the same as tohu. That is the same word translated without form in Genesis 1, 2. So gap theorists say that since God did not create it that way, it must have become that way. But again, the context is significant. In Isaiah, the context requires the use of the translation in vain. That is, God did not create the earth without a purpose. He created it to be inhabited. Genesis 1 tells us then how he brought form to the unformed earth and inhabitants to the empty earth. Uh, this, uh, this one may not uh, be so obvious, uh, but we will look at uh, Isaiah 45, 18 later and see uh, what, is, what the real context is. It was not really finished until he said so at the end of the six days of creation. The word tohu is actually translated 10 different ways in about 20 occurrences in the Old Testament. Just as an aside here, note that, that he keeps talking about uh, translations. Uh, typically the K T King James Version translation, because later he's going to argue against the King James translation as evidence for the gap. But uh, I found it interesting that he'll 
he'll say, well, it's been translated this way, uh, therefore it must be correct. And then later he said, well, it was translated this way, but that's wrong. Uh, Isaiah 45, 19 has the same word, and there it has to be translated vainly or in vain. It is also proper to translate it that way in Isaiah 45, 18. It depends on the context as to how it is to be precisely translated. In Genesis 1, 2, the context simply indicates the earth had no structure as yet. It was unformed. It was not, given, not even spherical at that point, but was comprised of only the basic elements of earth material. Sequence. Furthermore, it is important to note that the verse begins with the conjunction and. And this same conjunction introduces every single verse of the first chapter of Genesis. So there is a sequence of actions implied. There was this happening, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this. Each following directly upon the other. Or so you might assume, each following directly upon each other. We're going to see how verses begin uh, from another point of view later. When it said that God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, the implication is that this was immediately following the creation. Another argument of those who advocate the gap theory, let's, I'm going to have to interject something here just to keep you, I just can't let all of these go by. Uh, in, in one book of the Bible, and I'm trying to think of which one it was now, uh, a, a, a verse begins with and, and we know that there was a 38-year gap between the verse prior and that verse. Uh, they're historical, and, and we know the dates and so on, uh, but it, it, it begins with and, which means it's not necessarily immediately sequential, but sequential. Uh, but not necessarily immediately sequ sequential. So I just want you to understand that. And there are many, many places where uh, and starts a verse that is not immediately sequential to the verse in, uh, preceding it. Another argument of those who advocate the gap theory is that the word darkness suggests that something is wrong with the creation. But Isaiah 45, 7 says that God created the darkness. In order for there to be day and night, which was necessary, for the further activity of God and man upon the earth, there must be day and night. So does that say that darkness, there, there, there isn't sometimes something wrong with darkness? So God actually had to create darkness. Uh, thus there is nothing implicitly wrong with it being dark. God created it that way. Darkness later came to represent in some contexts a symbol of evil as opposed to light, since God is light and in him is no darkness at all. But in the context here, there is no evil connotation suggested, unless you believe in the gap theory. <laughs> okay? On the other hand, there are many overwhelming difficulties with the gap theory, and we, we really should not accept this as the interpretation of Genesis 1-2. The idea that the geological ages took place in between 1-1 and 1-2 is precluded by the plain biblical statement in the Ten Commandments where God said, this is the answer, this is it, close your Bibles, close your notes, everything is fully explained, and we know that there is no gap theory, because God said, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. That's it. That is, he was telling man that he must work six days and rest one day, because God worked six days and rested one day. The context goes on to say that everything in heaven and earth and in the sea was made in six days. There could have been nothing left over that was not made during the six days. The gap theory, on the other hand, would require that only the surface of the earth was reconstituted in the six days, uh, i.e., God would have said, in six days the Lord reconstituted the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Uh, but he didn't say that, therefore it must all be the same. Okay. Well, the key here, and we'll see it later, is that the word made here is the same word that's used in uh, Genesis for made, but it is not the word that is used for create. The word create is the word bahra. The word made is the word asa. Asa means to appoint or to set in order. Create means ex nihilo, create 
something out of nothing. So God does not say here, in six days the Lord created heaven and earth, the sea, and that all that is in them. It just says in six days God appointed them or set them in order. And we'll see that later in greater detail. The earth's core, the basic structure, the great fossil beds containing the remnants of the dinosaurs and so on, all of this would predate the six days of creation. But God says specifically that everything in the earth and in the heavens and in the sea was made in the six days. See the false argument there, right? Death before sin. Theologically, there is also a very grave difficulty with the gap theory. As a matter of fact, many of the uh, uh, young earth uh, theorists uh, say that if you believe in the gap theory, you cannot be saved. That you are unsaved. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, the Bible says there was no sin or death until man brought them into the world. According to the gap theory, however, there had already been billions of years of suffering and death in the world, represented by the fossils and the sedimentary rocks of the Earth's crust, which are supposed now to identify the geological ages. According to the gap theory, at the end of the geological ages, Satan sinned and was cast to the Earth, and then there was, pardon me, a great cataclysm, so that the geological ages, with billions of years of suffering and death, took place before Satan sinned, and certainly before man sinned. The Bible, on the other hand, specifically states, uh, says specifically that by one man sinner, sin entered into the world and death by sin. Romans 5.12 So that there was no death in the world until man brought sin into it. Context. Context. Here actually is the complete uh, Romans 5.12 Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. What's the context? Spiritual death. Spiritual death and resultant physical death, uh, not death among the animals. No, not death uh, related to the angels, not death related to anyone else, but uh, related to man, man, no one else. Notice how he left that out uh, in, he, in his quotation, uh, by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. Chop it off there, forget about the part that says uh, and death uh, spread to all men. The gap theory would require billions of years of suffering in the world before man or even Satan had sinned. And that means that God himself would be directly responsible for sin in the world. If A, then B. The gap theory would require billions of years of suffering in the world before man or even Satan had sinned. And that means that God himself would be directly responsible for sin in the world. God could not be the author of sin, so the gap theory is precluded theologically. Henry Morris is a PhD. He's a smart man. He's a smart man, but uh, apparently he knows more science than he knows Bible. When does he think Satan sinned? Uh, in the Garden of Eden after the creation of man. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Which how you can get that idea. And well, I know how, but I mean how he can, how he can take the verses that he takes and come up with that conclusion, I can't understand. He, if God created Satan and Satan sinned, then you could, he could say, well, I mean, somebody could say, well, God is the author of sin. He sure. created Satan. Right. Where did it come from? It had to be within Satan if God created Satan. Yep. Yes. So, uh, as we see, the, the arguments are not all that well constructed, not that accurate, not that biblical. Uh, somewhat childish, really, when you look at it. They're, they're really, really uh, immature uh, concepts. Well, let's work. Since uh, he is a PhD, he must know science, so let's see what he says about it being non-science. 
Scientifically, it won't work either because the whole essence of the geological age system, which some people try to accommodate by the gap theory, is based on what geologists call uniformitarianism. That is, the continuity of processes in the ancient world with those in the modern world. The very structure, by the way, uh, new young earth uh, uh, theorists uh, do not believe in uniformitarianism. The very structure of the geological age system is based on the assumption that present rates and processes are the same as those that took place in the past. There is no room for a worldwide cataclysm interrupting those processes in the system of the geological ages. That is why no geologist would ever accept the gap theory. Can you think of another reason that no uh, secular geologist would accept the gap theory? <laughs> I mean, is there another one, maybe? Does it have to be the fact that the... Okay. Uh, does not the, the geologists and archaeologists, uh, do they not believe in a cataclysm that killed off all the dinosaurs and everything? Yeah. So why, why, why not this cataclysm? Why some other cataclysm? And why, but why would they believe some other... Why would Morris say that they can't believe in a cataclysm Therefore, they couldn't believe in the gap theory when they truly do believe in a cataclysm. So another, he's not much on science either so far. Uh, that is why no geologist would ever accept the gap theory. In order to have a worldwide cataclysm that would destroy all the pre-cataclysm mountains and cast them into the sea so that there was the deep everywhere and then blow billions of tons of debris up into the sky so that there was darkness over the deep everywhere, as Genesis 1-2 describes it, it would have to be a worldwide nuclear explosion or volcanic explosion or something which would literally disintegrate the crust of the earth where the fossils and the sedimentary rocks are that identify the geological ages. Or perhaps a global ice sheath covering everything. And, and yeah, I mean, there are a lot of possibilities here. Um, Lots of possibilities other than how he describes it. So the gap theory would destroy the evidence for the geological ages in order to accommodate them. Oh, those gap theorists are dumb people, aren't they? They would destroy the evidence of the geological ages in order to accommodate them. Because only Henry uh, Morris's concept of cataclysm would, uh, could ha possibly happen, and that would destroy the, uh, the geological ages. It is a self-negating theory scientifically. It creates overwhelming scientific problems. No geologist would ever accept the gap theory. Therefore, we have to reject the gap theory as an interpretation of Genesis 1-2. We can be confident that a simple and straightforward, literal interpretation of the biblical record will satisfy all the real facts of geology. Except all the geologists reject the young earth theory even more than they reject the gap theory. All right, this is by Gadsby. Uh, it's a little more academic, uh, a, little, a little more uh, uh, studious in, in it um, than, than Henry Morris's ad hominem uh, straw man kind of arguments. So here's Gadsby. The interpretation of Genesis 1, 1, and 2 is, as it applies to the gap, or ruin reconstruction theory, revolves around four major points. The alleged, by gap theorists, difference in meaning between the Hebrew words bahra, to create, and asa, to do or to make. Gap theorists say that asa cannot mean to create, and so therefore Exodus 20.11, which speaks of God's making, asa, everything in six days, must refer not uh, original creation, but a supposed recreation. Okay, so he he saw my argument coming and immediately put this in here just in time for me to bring it up on the screen. Right? The grammatical, this is part, point two, the grammatical relationship of Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. Gap theorists affirm that the grammar allows or even requires a chronological hiatus between the events described by these two verses. That there's a time gap in there. We'll see that later, uh, how, uh, well, I, I, I'm not going to bring, 
bring it up on screen to show you, but, but Custance, uh, who wrote his book uh, in the, what, 1970, I think it was, uh, called uh, Without Form and Void, uh, has like 14 chapters on the use of the grammatical, on the grammatical relationship here and how it was used all the way back into before the time of Jesus. Uh, it, was, it, was inter it was translated became way, way back. Um, as far back as we can go, really, with, with translations or with, with uh, versions of the Bible. Okay. Um, point three. The translation of Hayatha in Genesis 1-2. Uh, proponents of the ruin reconstruction theory translate the earth became or had become formless and empty rather than the traditional was formless and empty. Uh, that's part of what we will see. Haya. The meaning uh, for the meaning of the expression bohu and wohu or vohu, uh, formless and empty. Gappus alleged that the expression itself implies a process of destruction. And we'll see reasons why gappers believe that or gapis, he calls us. Discussion. Probably the best up-to-date discussion of these exegetical points is that of Weston W. Fields in his book, Unformed and Unfilled, 1978. Fields shows that none of these claims by gap theorists will stand up to a critical contextual analysis. Well, it's a little misleading here because Fields does not show that. He states that. He states that. Just says... This can't be true, what the gap theorists say. So it's not really an in-depth analysis of the uh, context uh, or exegetics or grammatical either. Okay? Uh, we may notice the following points. Firstly, a study of the history of the exegesis of Genesis 1, 1, and 2 shows that the ruin reconstruction interpretation first appeared about the end of the 18th century. Evidently, in response to demands by geological science for long periods of time for strata formation. Remember when we studied here a few weeks back the gap theory, a long held tradition? Then we looked at the Hebrew uh, scholars way back, way, way back before the time of Jesus who had the same uh, interpretation. Uh, yeah, this, this is uh, one of. Uh, Fields uh, means of argument that he takes something that is proven to not be true, says it is true, and then says that that proves his point, that it's nobody ever thought of it before until Darwin came along and Darwin said that there had to be all of these geological ages. Then the Christians, being f afraid, Thomas Aquinas syndrome, as they some of them call it, uh, had to come up with some excuse, some way to make the Bible uh, true uh, in light of scientific discovery. And so in the uh, end of the 18th century, Christians came up with the gap theory so that, so that evolutionists could not poo-poo the Bible. Okay? That's what he's saying. The earliest interpretation available to us is that of the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, which was produced in Egypt in the century following 250-200 BC. The uh, Septuagint translation does not permit the reading in any, of any ruin reconstruction scenario as even Custance, a leading gapist, realized. Well, that's really not true, and we'll see that later also. Turning now to consider the four main issues mentioned above, Bahra and Asa. It is generally agreed that bara means to create. It refers to the production of that which had no existence before. Kyle and Delich, the premier Old Testament uh, uh, dictionary. Uh, however, faced with Exodus 20.11, gap theorists have sought to prove that a saw cannot mean to create, but means in this context to recreate, to make something out of substance previously existing. Thus, gapists do not interpret Exodus 20.11 as referring to the original creation, but to the six days of recreation held to be described in Genesis 1, 2, and following. Well, that's not really true either. Uh, Gappus say that uh, uh, 
it is, uh, well, okay, in this context, okay, I'll, I'll go along with that. We'll say that. A number of verses show, however, that bara and asa may be used interchangeably. Among them is Nehemiah 9, 6. This verse states that God made asa, the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry hosts, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and that all that is in them. The original, or the reference is clearly to the original creation. Is it? Does it have to be? Uh, remember the word asa means to appoint. Uh, and the word asa is used of, of uh, many, 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 many times as uh, the word appoint or to set in place. Okay. So uh, setting in place or appointing them uh, certainly would fit. Doesn't have to be a. Uh, it doesn't have to be created. Asa meaning created. Right. Uh, we presume that no gapus will want to propose a ruin reconstruction theory, which includes all of heaven and earth. Uh, even if he did, then it would presumably include the ordered strata of geology too, thereby evacuating the whole theory of its purpose. The fact is that the two words may be used interchangeably in the Old Testament. Indeed, in some places, they are used in synonymous parallelism. Uh, we're not going to look at all of those at this time because they will come up later. The grammar uh, of Genesis 1-2, and the earth was formless and empty, is a noun clause. Following verse 1, which is a subject and verb clause, verse 2a is therefore correctly identified as a circumstantial clause. That is a clause expressing the circumstances attending the fact described by the principal statement. So verse 2a explains more clearly the condition or the circumstances attending God's creative act. Grammatically then, verses 2a and also 2b and c constitute a description of the earth as originally created. This conclusion is supported by the recognition that the conjunction wa and the Hebrew we at the beginning of verse, of verse is a wa copulative copulative brings together, which grammarian Jacinius compares to the English phrase to wit, or to further explain, or whatever. Thus the grammatical relationship of verses 1 and 2 rules out the gap theory, since verse 2 actually comprises three clauses descriptive of the original condition of earth as created. The New International Version captures the sense, now the uh, earth was formless and empty. Third, the translation of Hayah to ha, part of the Hebrew word Hayah to be. Gap theorist A.C. Custance claims that of 1,320 occurrences of the verb Hayah in the Old Testament, only 24 can certainly be said to bear the meaning to be. But he makes the unwarranted deduction that therefore Hayah in Genesis 1-2 cannot mean was, but must mean became. No, he doesn't... Uh, make the unwarranted deduction, <coughs> he shows all of those examples to show that it could be, and then explains why it should be. He does not just make an, an unsubstantiated or unwarranted deduction. Given the argument of number two above, semantic considerations require that in this context was must be the correct translation. Well, if you believe what he said before. This is supported by the Septuagint, Furthermore, in Genesis 1-2, the Hayatha is not followed by the preposition le, which would have demanded the translation became and removed ambiguity. And we're going to look at all of that gra grammar, uh, and Custance did that. Uh, we're going to look at it again, or we'll look at it in another context here with the uh, other author that we're going to study. Four, the meaning of tohu and bohu. The argument that these expressions refers to a sinful and therefore not an original state of the earth relies on importing into Genesis 1-2 meanings from other Old Testament contexts such as Isaiah 34-11 and Jeremiah 4-23 which explain uh, it. While Tohu and Vohu together, only these three times occur together, only these three times in the Old Testament, Tohu appears alone in a number of places. The simple meaning common to these latter is formlessness however brought about, whether by judgment, destruction, or etc. Notice what it's brought about by. See what he even says? Formlessness, however, however brought about. 
whether by judgment or destruction. Okay, which is exactly the context of Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. The word itself contains no implication about the causes of formlessness. These must be gained from the context in which the word appears. Isaiah 45, 18, a favorite of Gappus, which is rendered by the King James Version, he created it not in vain, tohu, should be rendered, he did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. The context speaks of God's grace in restoring Israel. He did not choose his people in order to destroy them. He is the Lord who did not create the earth to be a chaos, but to be formed and filled during the remaining days of creation. <coughs> Do you get his argument there? That the context is that he didn't choose the earth to be formless. He didn't choose Israel to be destroyed. He didn't create the earth to be destroyed. He didn't create uh, Israel to be destroyed. Okay. Sounds to me like he's making a point that the earth was destroyed and Israel could be destroyed if you keep it up. If you, if you keep doing this, keep acting this way, you too can be destroyed. Though the expression tohu and bohu in Isaiah 34, 11 and uh, Jeremiah 4.23, do speak of a wasteness and emptiness resulting from judgment for sin. This meaning is not implicit in the expression itself, but is gained from the context. So if you have a word that's used in this context and means that, and it's used in this context and it means that, why can't it mean that in Genesis 1-2? Yes? You just said in that prior <laughs> Right. He's comparing that that he just countered himself. Right, restoring restoring the earth. Uh it had to have been Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's full of contradictions. They all they're always full of contradictions. I I get I get the idea that they are so wrapped up in in the flood as the explanation of all geological formations. And they're so wrapped up in trying to disprove evolution that they really don't know a whole lot of doctrine. They really don't know a whole lot of doctrine. So they don't get these, what seem to us to be obvious uh, errors. They don't, they don't see them because they're busy looking at some other aspect. Yeah. Right. Doesn't. Yeah. They, the arrogance of, of uh, I'm right no matter what other evidence is out there. I'm right. And Therefore, that evidence has to be wrong. Yeah. yeah. That's basically it. All right. The simple meaning of Genesis 1 2 is that God created the earth unformed as yet and unfilled as yet. The sequel in Genesis 1 relates how the earth was progressively formed and filled. By the way, the suggestion that because Genesis 1.28 refers in the King James Version to replenishing the earth, therefore the earth must have been at some previous time already plenished, is trite. The simple meaning of the Hebrew word is to fill, not to refill. Uh, and I think he's the one. Oh, okay, well, we got Taylor's, what does replenish? I, I did stick Taylor in here. Okay, um, his conclu Gadsby's conclusion. The foregoing discussion on the exegesis of Genesis 1, 1 through 2 should serve to illustrate the extremely tenuous exegetical support that exists for the ruin reconstruction theory. The interested reader is directed to Field's book for a thorough discussion of these and other relevant points. Um, and we shall look at Field's errors and Field's... Uh, book um, as well. But let's look at Charles Taylor. What does replenish the earth mean? Question 128 of Genesis in the King James Version contains the expression replenish the earth. Some have used this translation to support the gap theory, also known as ruin reconstruction, 
which involves the necessity for God to refill the earth after a pre-Adamic race had perished as a result of a so-called Lucifer's flood. Is this interpretation correct? This was a question asked, and Charles Taylor answers it, no. The word replenish occurs seven times in the King James Version. Here in uh, Genesis 1.28 and again in Genesis 9.1, both times in the imperative mood, the command mood, and five times in three major prophets in the passive and causative forms. So does the Hebrew original in these cases really mean refill? But before getting to the Hebrew, we must ask why the King James Version translators use the verb replenish. An examination of the OED shows that the word was used to mean fill from the 13th to the 17th centuries. In no case quoted in these five centuries does it unambiguously mean refill. The OED defines replenish as having 10 meanings throughout its history. Here it is. Fully stocked, provided, supplied, filled, pervaded, physically or materially filled, full, made full, make full, fill, stock with, as in this man made the new forest and replenished it with wild beasts. Whoa. Okay, that looks sounds like a replenish to me. Uh, inhabit, settle, occupy, the whole of, fill with food, satiate, fill, uh, fill the heart, fill with the feeling, fill up again, fill up a vacant office, become full, attain to fullness. Notice that only one includes the idea again. Well, I saw a couple of them actually, but, but there's only one according to him. This use first appears in a poem in 1612. It appears in, again in Pepys' diary where he says, buy to replenish the stores. Only the year 1612 is anywhere near the date of the King James Version, 1611, and it's a poetic use. There's no consequence here. Nobody got time for that. The Hebrew original of Genesis 128 is not poetic. All other uses range from the 17th to the 19th century when it tends to die out in normal writing. Uh, the English word comes through a lot of changes from the Latin pleo or replio. There's also the adjective plenus, filled, so we must now trace the prefix re and see what it means. In very old Latin, why? Why do, why do we need to do that? <coughs> why do we care about what the Latin says? We need to care about what the Hebrew says, right? So, skip the Latin. But basically what he's saying is that the Latin... Latin that a lot of the uh, English King James translation came from the Latin Vulgate. Okay, so uh, then uh, here are some examples from Latin authors to fill up. They made up for filled, fill, filled, and full. And uh, uh, replete is an English word that means uh, full up with food. Doesn't mean full again. Well, could be. All right, so my understanding of the word in the King James is that replenished then just meant fill up, though some hundred years later it began to mean refill when some scholars convinced people that re should really mean again. <coughs> so in 1611, it's clear that the translators didn't necessarily convey anything about a second filling in the earth. Uh, now, the, as to the Hebrew word itself, it is uh, male, the simple verb fill, Strong's Concordance. In its various forms, it occurs 306 times. Uh, only seven times does the King James translate it as replenish, but 195 times to fill, filled, or full. Other times it becomes fulfill or has some idiomatic meaning. Quite clearly, the idea of refilling is completely absent from the Hebrew. There's no doubt on that score. What did he just base that on? The King James Version translation, right? Um, we all know that languages change over the years. So that's the real explanation of the misunderstanding about this verse that tells us that God commanded the first humans to fill up completely the earth he had prepared for them. Finally, the proof is that the similar phrase in verse 22 has the translation fill in the King James Version. So his summary, the word translated replenish simply means fill in the Hebrew, although he does not discuss its 306 occurrences to establish that it always means fill, does he? He only says that King James Version translated it replenish on, on uh, seven times, okay? In the English of King James Day, replenish also usually meant fill, not refill. We don't care. We don't worship the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, we don't think the King James Version of the Bible was inspired. I'll get letters about that, but uh, 
but uh, it was the Hebrew that was inspired. The word replenish, therefore, cannot be used to support the idea. Okay? Good enough for the Apostle Paul. It's good enough for us, right? Okay. All right. Well, let's close. And then next hour, we're going to look at a gap theorist uh, who is such a, such a uh, dedicated gap theorist. The title of his book is, uh, it's, not, it's Not a Theory. Uh, the Gap. It's Not a Theory. I think is the exact way it reads. So we'll look at that next time and see how he explains them, and then we'll see which one has the better arguments uh, in this uh, debate. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. Uh, we uh, pray for the uh, authors whom we have read and those who uh, rely on them for their doctrine, uh, that they might become more familiar with uh, the other doctrines of the Bible besides the, their version of the creation uh, doctrine so that they might uh, understand the context of these things uh, in a better way and more fully appreciate your word and the things that you have done uh, on our behalf. We thank you for it in Jesus' name.